Todd Network News. Where we give you a new perspective. On events happening in our world today. This is GNN. This is God Network News, Episode 22. Welcome, GNN fans, to another episode of God Network News, the podcast that tells you what God's doing around the world, not what CNN tells you, but what GNN tells you is going on in the world. If you're tired of listening to all of that crisis network news and you want to hear what God's doing, well, give us a listen. Uh, We've got a great message by a speaker who grew up in the Soviet Union, who is now a mission executive, and he will be sharing with us about the impact of non-Western missions. This should be really exciting. I feel like apologizing as a grandfather speaking to the younger leaders. There's no other way I would qualify to come to this conference. I uh, have an apology or two. One is I did shave off my mustache. (laughs) And it was not coming to this conference. It was a millennial move. It just shows how long some of us have not met. Because somebody followed me around, and they later explained they recognized my voice but couldn't recognize my, my face. And, you know, when you grow up under communism, as I did, you always worry when somebody follows you around. (laughs) So I did turn around and say, why, what are you doing? And this person said, I heard you at Urbana in 1990, I think she said, but you had mustache. Okay, I don't any longer. Uh, Secondly, I speak English with an accent like some of you. (laughs) That's because I started learning English too late in life. There is a scientific theory that says if you learn a foreign language before the age of puberty, you will speak like the natives, like the nationals. If you do it after that, you have no chance, (laughs) except you are musically extraordinarily gifted, which I am not. So my children speak better English than I do, but I assure you, I write better English than they do. (laughs) So um, here we are. And I do have another confession to make. How many of you are suffering from jet lag? You either don't understand the word or you've been healed supernaturally. (laughs) Jet lag, when there is this discord between your this, clo- this watch and your body clock? Oh, my goodness. I made a big mistake. I came out of Southern Balkans about 10 days ago. Was in Texas for a week, lecturing three hours a day. By the way, one should never, ever go to Texas for the first time. That's one thing I've learned. I suffered from jet lag there. And then, uh, just as I was exiting jet lag, and my mouth was full of canker sores. If you don't have a dictionary, ask your physician what that is. <laughs> and I came here, and I was suddenly engulfed in this additional, you know, tsunami-like jet lag wave. So I was so glad when I saw the program that I was speaking in the morning because at 2, 2.30, I was fully awake. And then they changed it last night, so I really need your prayers. <laughs> okay, um, I am a native Slovenian. That's the most northern part of former Yugoslavia, now independent republic. If you travel from... Can we have that map that I've asked for? I have lived in Serbia. Well, Yugoslavia is gone. They just invented another map. (laughs) 
if you want to travel by car, I have to do this holy geography because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from Europe. I'm from that part of the world that's mentioned in the Bible three times. <laughs> Titus went to Dalmatia, remember, Dalmatian coast? Preached the gospel all the way from Jerusalem to Illyricum, the Roman province. And then, of course, he recognized Macedonia. And by the way, here in the first row, and, and maybe there are some others, we have people from all of these republics. These are all independent nations. Now, we are the most productive nation-producing <laughs> former federal nation. So I want my friends from Croatia and Serbia and Macedonia and Dalmatia and Bosnia to stand. Come on. Come on, Christian. Yeah. We, uh, we assure you this generation is not responsible for the inter-ethnic warfare, ethnic cleansing, and all of those things that have happened there. Well, so I was born in Slovenia. I have lived for two years in Serbia. I have relatives in Belgrade. I've lived for two years in, Bel uh, sorry, in Bosnia, which was my first missionary calling, and I'm a citizen of Croatia. So when people hear this, and they know what happened in recent history there, they say, wait a moment, who are you actually? Aren't you a little confused? You come from that part of the world where they've reinvented ethnic cleansing at the end of the 20th century, where people are frantically searching for their ethnic identity. You know, we, we live in a war, in a world full of wars, wars of identities. And very often it's ethno-religious identities fighting against other ethno-religious identities. So they say uh, people are searching for their ethnic identity in your part of the world and others are even fanatically fighting for their ethnic purity. Who are you? What's your identity? Aren't you a little confused? And if anybody would dare to kind of doubt that I might be confused, I use a little pedagogical device and I try to confuse them in return. So I bring my wife Vlasta into the picture. You see, I met Vlasta in a theological college in Germany where she came from Serbia, although she is Croatian, although her father is half German and her mother is fully Czech. <laughs> the answer is in the words of the great poet Robert Frost who said, don't worry about me, I'm not confused, I'm just well mixed. <laughs> but my friends, the Apostle Paul tells us that whoever is in Christ is a new creation. Whoever is in Christ is a new creation. And once you have been given new life and you are a new creation, you are automatically incorporated into that new family of the redeemed. Because if we believe as we do, because he taught us to, in the universality of the love of Jesus, the gospel is for all nations, all, ethne, all ethnic groups. If you believe in the universality of the love of Jesus, by the very logic you believe in the internationality of the believing body, of the church. So the church of Jesus Christ is, is so wonderfully exemplified here at this gathering this week. The church of Jesus Christ is international, interracial, interethnic, interdenominational intergenerational and whatever other inter you can find. <laughs> so we have a new identity. Of course it's nice to have Africans swing and s s sing. That's their culture. And it's nice to try some Chinese cuisine <laughs> and discuss philosophy with Germans. <laughs> and so on. So we do have 
our backgrounds, our cultures, our national dress. And that's wonderful. That's part of this wonderful diversity, this great mosaic of God's creation. But that, uh, that is not our primary identity anymore. Our primary identity is in Christ, in that new humanity, in that community of the redeemed. And that's why we have a message of reconciliation and healing for our antagonistic, conflicting, broken world. That's why I think your generation of evangelical leaders needs to look especially at this aspect of peacemaking and reconciliation across the ethnic and religious lines to discover the horizontal and the social dimension of reconciliation, which is contained in the very message and power of life-transforming, community-transforming message of the gospel. Because it's only there that we find how to replace Revenge with reconciliation, hatred with love. This is, this is something we, we have learned. This, this, this wonderful group here come from different, you know, I see, a, I see a Serbian lady sitting next to Croat. That's only in the body of Christ. And you go to some of the, some of the churches in Bosnia and you will find all three ethnic groups there under the cross. There is reconciliation. Under the cross, there is hope for our broken world. Now, when uh, in 74, I I think the secret was given away. I was in Lausanne. I was a 28 years old principal of a two years young theological institute in communist Yugoslavia. And I feel like uh, J.F. Kennedy, the young American president who came to Berlin, and he said, Ich bin ein Berliner. Some of you know that history. I feel like saying, Ich bin ein Lausanner. (laughs) Because Lausanne 74 truly transformed my life. It changed my horizons broadened my horizons. It tore down some prejudices. It drilled some holes in my academic pride and scholarly uh, aspirations. I discovered what kingdom of God is all about. We heard some of those great saints and then they became friends like Francis Schaeffer and and John Stott and Ralph Winter and others. And at the same time, We heard some fiery Latinos with brilliant minds like Samuel Escobar and Rene Padilla and others. And we sat together for almost two weeks. The Time magazine wrote a report, I remember, and said the most formidable uh, forum of Christian leaders since the Apostolic Council in Jerusalem. (laughs) And there are a few others here who have been in Lausanne. They just don't want to confess it because <laughs> then they, they, their age will be given away. By the way, I, I've, this, you are all younger leaders, okay? Some of you I met after a number of years because you were my students, and I'm actually surprised how old you look. <laughs> I came back from Lausanne well, I, there, is, there are a number of things I learned in Lausanne. I've given up on my ambition to become a textual critic, to write a dissertation. I was offered a scholarship at a leading university to do something in textual criticism, all Slavonic text, and compare it with different Greek traditions. I had some of the linguistic skills in that area. I am glad the Lord saved me from that because there are only five, maybe not even five people in the world that would read that. <laughs> and, yeah, truly... Because it was at Lausanne that I learned that theology must serve the kingdom of God. Otherwise, it's a selfish, whatever sophistication there may be, it's a selfish academic exercise. And if it is not serving the kingdom of God, what's the good of it? 
It's there that I learned that all theology must be missiologically focused. But at the same time, that all missiology must be theologically grounded. So they go hand in hand. And I very often say, let no seminary put asunder what God has put together. Okay? (laughs) Well, it was at Lausanne that I heard about unrich people groups. And I came home, we had this, this, this young school, 28, I think, students from all over former Yugoslavia. Later, we got them from the Soviet bloc countries. And I shared with them the concept. And they said, well, this is all so far away, and we cannot you know, go as missionaries to reach the unreached on other continents. But I said, what about two million Albanians on our side of the border in a place called Kosovo? Ah, well, what about altogether about four million Muslims in former Yugoslavia? And then we did a little study. I said, what about unreached cities? And we did a little study, and we looked at the cities and towns with 50,000 or more population, with no Christian, no evangelical witness. And we discovered there were 36 of them, and we documented it very well. So we initiated a prayer chain, praying around the clock. And students discovered, I discovered, that prayer is the most important theological task, as Karl Barth used to remind us. Or as a great Scottish theologian, P.T. Forsyth, said, that prayerlessness is the worst sin of Christians. And so there was a real prayer, engaging prayer for 36 cities, And then suddenly God started calling those that prayed for certain cities and somebody moves to Pula and somebody moves to Pristina and somebody moves somewhere else. And before this great country fell apart, by God's grace, we planted churches in all of these 36 cities, including Split. Pastor's wife is here, the pioneering, the first Protestant workers in Split. So, uh, and I could go on, ich bin ein Lausanner. Okay, I'm very grateful for Lausanne. And whatever ministry we began, I took the Lausanne Covenant as, as a statement of faith. Now, leadership, my team is actually the whole gospel and the Great Commission. Or you could put it differently. Why the Jesus' is Great Commission is greater than the Great Commission? The way we often read it. Okay, But before I enter into that text, let me say a couple of things about uh, leadership. We have learned under communism, I have lived uh, longer than what your ultimate age for entry to this conference is, uh, is under communism. Some of our friends in some countries of the world still do. And we have learned that the enemy of the church doesn't like strong Christian leadership. They prefer weak leadership, weak in will and stature and skills so that they can be manipulated, weak intellectually so they can be misled, out-argued, made look naive and ridiculous, shown inadequate, ignorant, obscurantist, irrelevant, weak morally so that they can be exploited, even blackmailed. And it seems to me that one of the greatest needs for the body of Christ, especially in the two-thirds world, and this is a challenge for your generation, for all of us, is to develop a new base of Christian leaders. A kind of leadership that is dedicated to the highest purpose, but at the same time equipped with the greatest possible wisdom. Professional competence and spiritual commitment, attitude of servanthood, broken and humble, and yet confident because we know who the Lord is and we know not only him and his gospel, we also study and understand the realities of the world and the time 
in which we have been placed by our sovereign Lord. Okay? The kind of servant leadership that is biblically grounded, culturally sensitive, creative, and brave, socially relevant, and personally mature. If I may say, your generation needs to set the tone. You need to be the opinion makers, thought leader. I, did you hear me? I didn't say opinionated. That's a little different in English. <laughs> opinion makers. It seems to me that the evangelical church worldwide has grown to such an extent that we must start thinking beyond some of our old restraining, limiting paradigms. We need public theologians. We need prophetic witnesses in our societies. We need teachers of ethics. I could find you a job for at least 20 of you if you had a PhD in ethics in East European, formerly communist universities. We need to reclaim the culture for Christ and his kingdom. So the TV and drama and arts and journalism, a number of challenges. We need among our evangelical younger leaders human rights champions and proponents of democratic pluralist social order without compromise or without giving up our identity of who we are in Christ and who we are as the body of Christ in the world. There was a study done not that long ago and that concerns me as an educator. At the heart I'm really an evangelist and I still do evangelism but I've become an educator because that was a great need, great need really in my part of the world. But there was a survey done, a study that showed that in North America, there is one well-equipped Christian leader, trained Christian leader, for every 1,300 people, okay? In Western Europe, it's one per 90,000 people. Now, in the two-thirds world, where the church has moved, because remember... The center of gravity of Christian faith has shifted south and east. Christianity has a non-white face. This is what I like about Lausanne because we recognize that by our, by our participation. But in that two-thirds world where you have the vitality, where you have the vibrancy, where you have numbers, where people are saying some 80,000 become Christians every day, in that two-thirds world, there is only one well-equipped Christian leader for every 600,000 people. Have you heard me? In North America, for every 1,300, you've got a trained minister, let's say, Christian leader. In the two-thirds world, where the church is growing fastest, it takes 600,000 of that population to find one trained Christian leader. Let me leave this statistic as a challenge. I think there is a need for a major strategic rethinking, the change of paradigm of how we do Christian leadership in our global world. Now, so that, that, that itself makes it imperative for us to look for new ways, new vision new strategy to train national leaders because if we don't and I'm not talking just formal training there are various ways of training and I know a lot is going on and there are agencies here that are doing a lot of that but much more needs to be done because wherever there is a spiritual openness all kinds of cults and isms and heresies and syncretisms and everything floods in and if you don't have mature, biblically grounded uh, Christian leaders, the flock will go hungry and you may end up losing them. Or you may have an emotionally driven Christianity that makes no transform has no transformative effect on the society in which God has placed them. And we have been called to be salt and light. So the salt and light effect is extremely important. In a small group that I was meeting informally with yesterday, two of you said, well, the whole gospel, the whole church, the whole world, 
We know what the whole world is. We are global citizens. We are on the internet. We travel. We think we know what the whole church is. But what do you mean by the whole gospel? Friends, there are too many half gospels around. That's why we think, that's why we talk about the whole gospel. And half gospels, P.T. Forsyth said, half gospels are like the famous mule. They have no dignity and no future, neither pride of ancestry nor hope of posterity. And we need to be reminded that the whole gospel means total. I should have answered your question. The whole gospel is all 15 articles of the Lausanne Covenant. Seeing that as a whole. Okay? Because that is the finest, most comprehensive consensus statement taking into account the full-fledged biblical theology and all of the global realities and linking the two in that finest of the documents. That's the whole gospel. Now, the whole gospel means total commitment to all, that, to all the demands of Jesus Christ, including the whole spectrum of ethical requirements that are inherent in the gospel message. It means for us, as Paul says to Philippians, to live worthy of the gospel of Christ. The whole gospel is the joyful celebration of God's gift of salvation, as we do here. The whole gospel is the continuous openness to the Holy Spirit to confirm his word. The whole gospel covers proclamation of truth and exhibition of love, manifestation of power and integrity of life. And so, my friends, in this great task of world evangelization that the Lausanne movement has on the top of its agenda, if we are to be the whole gospel people who take the whole, the whole gospel to the whole church, uh, the, who mobilize the whole church to take the gospel to the whole world, we will need less competition and more cooperation. Less self-sufficiency and more self-denial. Less ambition to lead and more willingness to serve. Less of a drive to dominate and more of the desire to, the, to develop. So in the context of what we are talking about, we have to ask a number of questions that we cannot handle tonight. But if you look at Lausanne, do you have this little document? Look at Article 5 on page 95. Okay, let's do it quickly. I'm asking, pleading for a few minutes for that because this is exercise. Okay, if you go down row 12 and you see Christ, okay, listen what's part of the gospel. The message of salvation implies also a message of judgment upon every form of alienation, oppression, and discrimination, and we should not be afraid to denounce evil and injustice wherever they exist. When people receive Christ, they are born again into his kingdom and must seek not only to exhibit... Are you with me? Do you have the document? Okay. But also to spread its righteousness in the midst of an unrighteous world. The salvation we claim should be transforming us in the totality of our personal and social responsibilities. Faith without works is dead. This is part of the whole gospel. This is part of God's purposes and intentions for humanity. Because we are not just to save souls for heaven. We are to make disciples on earth. The church is not God's waiting room for the hereafter, a kind of a place that collects and conserves sinners for heaven. The church, and we are that church, is to be God's transformative agent in the world. So what about the Great Commission in the light of the Great Gospel? If we could have the text of the Great Commission... You see, there are various kinds of Christians in the world, various denominations, various traditions, various degrees of commitment and levels of practice. In Europe, we talk about nominal Christianity. In America, they talk about cultural Christianity. In Eastern Europe, we talk about ethnic Christianity. Or I talked about many people who are cal calendar Christians, 
because it's Easter and, and, and Christmas, and that's their Christianity. Various kinds of Christianity. What I see here is experiential Christianity at this conference. Okay? Enthusiastic Christianity. Now, the evangelicals have coined a new term, and that is Great Commission Christians. That's a new language. Describing those who personally know the Lord Jesus as their Savior and Lord and are willing and capable to share the good news. Those who are evangelizing, winning others to Christ, which, my friends, is the most holy and most urgent task. Are you a Great Commission Christian? I'm sure you are. You wouldn't be here. Okay? Now, I must confess, however, a little uneasiness the way many of my friends in our evangelical movement uh, define the Great Commission. Because they start with verse uh, 18. Go. Okay? They even drop the therefore. And it becomes go. 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 But friends... The Great Commission does not begin with our going, but with his being. Not with our obedience, but with his authority. It's the Western activistic mindset that that, that wants to take over. It's go, go and do. That's why we have a little tension globally. We've had this throughout the Lausanne history. Because there are Westerners who are always looking for methodologies. How to be more effective, how to get greater numbers. And there are people who come out of antagonistic uh, circumstances and they are looking for authenticity. Because in many parts of the world, the question is not, how shall they hear? The question, the first question is, what shall they see? And depending on what they see, the answer can be given on how shall they hear? Okay? Now, uh, so Great Commission begins a little earlier, and I would summarize it this way. We don't have time here for an uh, exegetically-based exposition. And by the way, one needs to look at other versions. We, we we, we, We just quote this one all the time. There is one in Luke 24. There's one in Mark 16, which the Charismatics like. There is Acts 1.8. John Stott has helped us through the Lausanne process to discover the Johannine, John's version. Okay? As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Or in the same manner, I send you. And so we talk about the incarnational involvement, which is more than just contextualizing or translating for a new culture. How did the Father send Jesus? When they had a conference in the Holy Trinity, if you allow me a little imagination here, it's not canonical. Uh, Jesus didn't say to the Father, you want to send me down to that dirty planet Earth? The people are nasty. Don't you remember what they did to Moses and the prophets? Why don't we create a broadcasting station up here somewhere between heaven and Earth? Why don't we evangelize from a safe distance? Okay? Jesus didn't pick up a big heavenly megaphone to shout down to the inhabitants of the planet Earth, Repent all! (laughs) I would be the first one that wouldn't believe him. He took upon himself human flesh. He entered our history. He became a refugee already as a baby. He was hungry and thirsty in every way. He was fully human. In every way he identified with us. Except that he did not sin which uniquely qualified him to take your sins and my sins and have them nailed to the cross. Incarnational involvement. We have learned during the war in the Balkans that you cannot evangelize from a safe distance. You cannot just drop tracts and disappear to a safe place in Austria. Where there are growing ministries is where people stayed, identified, and were ready to say, okay, Jesus, there's good news for bad times. There is hope for despair. There is this message of life for the people who are bombarded by that. And the results are actually amazing. Now Jesus 
turns to his disciples here. They are on the mountain that has a significance, a place of revelation, and so on. They worship. There is some doubt. And then he says, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. That is the first part of what we call Great Commission. I call it the Great Foundation, okay? And then in the last verse you have the promise, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You have the great promise. You have the great foundation and the great promise and the great commission is sandwiched in between. Sorry about this consumer language. Sandwich in between. The great foundation built on it, growing out of it, of who Jesus is, how he lived, what he taught, why he died, and what happened on the third day. If we don't know these historic facts, if we don't teach this truth, we don't have a foundation for the Great Commission. And without that foundation, you don't have a message. So when Jesus says all, of, of course that's, that's a dangerous statement, when he says all power, this is NIV, all authority, exousia is difficult to translate. You could translate all dominion. It's have, it has something to do with his teaching on the kingdom and the fact that he is now risen Lord. It's after three years of this peripatetic seminary where he taught them and now this great redemptive event took place, the cross and the resurrection. And he makes this claim before he goes to the Father, all power is given to me. Friends, if you hear anybody else make that claim, call FBI. <laughs> call Scotland Yard. Call Homeland Security or whatever it's called. It's a very dangerous statement. We've had a few who claimed all power. We had in Europe an Adolf Hitler and a Josef Vissarionovich Stalin. You had here in Asia a Mao Zedong and Pol Pot, to name only two. Very dangerous statement. My friends, he's the only one that can make that statement legitimately. Because of how he lived and what happened on the cross and what happened on the third day. You see, he's the only one the only person who walked the planet Earth whose hands never stole, whose lips never lied. You think of that, that his lips never lied? Maybe there's somebody here who never lied. Okay, be brave and lie for the first time. <laughs> and then... Uh, we will have the highest committee, Doug Birdsall, Paul Stanley, and others uh, make a decision whether we will practice exorcism or take you to a psychiatrist. He is the only person in whose life there was a perfect harmony between word and deed, theory and practice, in whose mind there was never an erroneous thought, in whose heart there was never an evil motive. He can legitimately make that statement also because... His power is moderated and motivated by love. Now think for a moment. If you have only power but no love, there is a destructive potential there. If you have only love but no power, you may have just a helpless sentiment. But the divine genius is that you have power and love together in that one person, Jesus Christ. The crucified one, and yet the risen one. And so he says, all authority is given to me. Without that, we don't have a gospel. Without the cross and resurrection, we don't have a foundation for the Great Commission. Now, we come then to the Great Commission. That we know, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. So I will not dwell on this. Uh, it's just to say that go is not an imperative in the original language. It's a circumstantial uh, participle. It has a certain imperative force. Grammarians among you know that. But it's not an imperative form. There is only one, there is only one imperative in this whole passage. And that is mateteusate. Make disciples. Make disciples. And friends, we evangelicals need to obey Jesus because we are learning to make converts in our, rather than disciples. We count hands. We are preoccupied with success quantitatively expressed in numbers. Okay. 
you know, the gospel is not a commodity. And marketing can be very helpful. But if the foundation is not there and the motives are not pure and the presence of the Spirit is not there, it's just a religious enterprise and our responsibility will be great. People are not just numbers that you add up on digits. I heard somebody say, how much does it cost for one soul to be saved in your country? I said, what do you mean? And when they explained what I mean, I felt like repenting for them because they were not ready for repentance. (laughs) Souls are priceless. You can't buy them. You can't sell them. The price was paid on Calvary by our Lord. And so we must rethink evangelism in terms of the way Jesus teaches it. Luzan article number four, if you still have that book open, it says in the last uh, two sentences on the nature of evangelism, in issuing the gospel invitation, we have no liberty to conceal the cost of discipleship. Jesus still calls all who would follow him to deny themselves, take up their cross, and identify themselves with his new community. The results of evangelism include obedience to Christ, incorporation into his church, and responsible service in the world. So, let's make disciples. Let's conceive of missions in terms of discipleship rather than mere gospel proclamation. Let's think of how to work together. I was talking to a Baptist leader in Moscow recently, and I've been going to Moscow since 78 for ministry, and he started crying. He said it was, maybe it was easier under communism. They forced us into one church. Now they bring from the West so many Jesuses. There is a Baptist Jesus, and there is a Presbyterian Jesus, and there is a Southern Jesus, and there is a Northern Jesus, and there is an Assemblies of God Jesus, and, and, and on and on. He says, and these Jesuses compete with each other. <laughs> and he said, we saw some reports And if those reports of those agencies and missionaries were true, Russia has been saved three times over. (laughs) Friends, we must face these realities because it's a question of integrity. It's a question of honoring our Lord. It's a question of doing evangelism in Jesus' way and for Jesus' glory or we will not have lasting results. If we don't honor our Lord with our lifestyle, with our message, with the way we live in the community. We are betraying the kingdom rather than serving the kingdom. And of course, here is where unity is so, so important. And that's why I'm, I am a Lausanner. I need to close. The gospel, the whole gospel, the great commission begins with the great foundation. Who Jesus is, what he taught, how he lived, why he died, and what happened on the third day. That's the foundation. Then comes the commission. Going, making disciples, baptizing, incorporating them in the body of Christ. And then we have the promise. And I will be with you to the very end. And it's not just the end of the age. In the original, pasastas, hemeras, every day, the whole day of every day, he is with us. The living Lord walks with us in whatever circumstances he's with us. Of course, there is the blessed hope at the end. But that hope should not be an escape clause for us to be passive and wait for him to appear. And it certainly should not have us engage in apocalyptic speculation. Because there are evangelical bodies that have created this end-time industry. And they know more about the end time calendar than Jesus ever wanted to disclose. And so from the late great planet Earth to the left behind, so much is left out. Because we major... (laughs) Friends, I am not worried about the end time calendar. The end of history has been predetermined by the center of history on the cross and on the third day. And let us not give in. To, 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 uh, uh, there's a lot of energy and money in this. And I'm sometimes worried. I know this sounds dangerous, what I'll say now. Horrible. I sometimes wonder whether this doesn't serve as a kind of an evangelical substitute for astrology. Friends, let's come back to the substance of the gospel. Let's consider Christ in his wisdom, in his beauty. Let's be holistic 
gospelers. Make disciples among the nations. Bring honor and glory to his name. To his name. Amen. We want to remind all of you that we do have a phone number here in the United States that you can call for free. It's uh, area code 206-350-7001, and you can leave us a voice message on that. Or you can go right to our website that is at podomatic.com, and that's uh, godnews.podomatic.com. And if you go to that website... You can also record a comment just by clicking on record a comment. And you can also join our mailing list, which we would really like. And you can also send us an email at godnews at podomatic.com. And make sure, please, that you click on the vote for us at godcast1000.com and some of the other podcast search engines that are there. Please vote for us. We appreciate your loyalty to keep coming back to us and keep downloading uh, these episodes. And we trust that they'll be a continued blessing to you.